Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Robin Axel Adams. I am the manager of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics. It is great to have you here today on our first lecture back after our summer break. We are so excited this morning. Um, as happens in the fall, we start our ethics fellowship group, and so we have our ethics fellows with us. I would like to just briefly introduce them. I'm just going to share with you who they are and then um, have them stand. And I have just come to appreciate that, Sharon, I do not think I have practiced how to say your last name. So I'm just going to say Sharon. But Sharon, how do you pronounce your last name? In a joke, eh? Una Joke, all right, Sharon Una Joke is a doctor. She's an adolescent medicine fellow at IU. We have Adria Gorillo Peck, who is um, the vice president of integrated care management. Allie Card is a speech pathologist at Riley, and she's also a third year law student. Uh, Sarah Lieber Hall is a social worker, a medical social worker in the MICU at University Hospital. Amanda Wilhelm is a nurse at Riley Hospital for Children in the Emergency Department. Tom Joy is with us. Tom is a PhD student at Purdue University. Um, Christy Espinal is the Director of Education at IU Methodist uh, Family Medical Residency. And Vicki Strock is the Manager of Quality and Equipment with um, the AHC Respiratory Care. So we are so excited to be able to welcome our fellows and have them come into our midst. So welcome. Um, please make sure that you signed in at the entrance um, as you entered there or wherever you might be located. That way you can receive your CE and your CME evaluations. You get those at the end of the lecture series. Uh, so be looking for an email next May um, to help fill out the evaluations. We want to invite you and draw attention to our conference that is coming up. Um, we have our third clinical ethics conference, uh, which is on Friday. No, it is on Friday, September 27th. This Friday is the last day to register for that. So if you would like to go to our website um, and please get registered for that. It's gonna be a really um, wonderful and exciting day. And you can see all the events that are happening uh, when you go to that website too. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast today. It is so exciting that our lecture uh, series continues to grow with all of our broadcast sites. So we welcome our broadcast sites. We are trying something new today for broadcasting. So thank you um, for, for all of you who on broadcast sites who have been patient with us as we work through our sometimes our technical glitches. But we wanna welcome those from um, Arnett and Ball, Blackford, Jay, West, and North, from Clark, and from Gulosi, and from Reed Health. So it is so exciting to have all of you joining with us. I want to remind you to turn um, your electric devices to silent or to vibrate. And if you need to um, take a call to please do so out of the auditorium. And I always need to say that Dr. Martin, our speaker, has no financial um, conflicts of interest to disclose. All right, so it is my great pleasure to welcome up Dr. Amy Martin. Um, Amy comes to us from the um, here. She's been with us almost a year. Um, she can claim newness for a little while longer, but she came to us from Presence Health in Chicago, Illinois. She holds a master's degree from Loyola University Chicago's Department of Philosophy and Applied Healthcare Ethics, and a doctorate from Loyola's Strict School of Medicine and Bioethics and Health Policy. But comes to us uh, via Minnesota, but she has been in Indiana before. She earned a Bachelor's of Arts from DePaul University, so Indiana is not uh, too strange to her. But prior to 2007, Amy um, was an intern at the University of Minnesota Center for Bioethics. She was a clinical fellow at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois, and she taught dental ethics at the UIC Dental School. So outside of her work of Pres at Presence Health when she was in Chicago, Amy has been an adjunct professor at Loyola University in Chicago in the Department of Philosophy and was a member of state task force concerning matters of healthcare ethics. Amy is getting her feet planted here and her impact is already wide. And we so appreciate all of the great resources that Amy has brought. Amy is working very hard out in the system, which you're gonna learn more about in a minute, but we appreciate her knowledge and her sense of humor and the joy that she brings to our department. But Amy um, does have some free time and in that free time, she enjoys traveling a lot, spending as much time outdoors as she can. And if you ever want to just have her um, instantly have a great conversation with her, just ask her about her dog, Bean. And so we welcome Amy to share with us what's going on with IU Health Ethics. 
I was going to say good morning, but I think it's afternoon now. So good afternoon. All right. Um, again, Robin, thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, today, I will be talking about what clinical ethics is at IU Health. A little roadmap for the day. Uh, we'll go over who are we, as in who is the ethics department at IU Health. Where are we now? What does ethics look like across the system? Where are we going? Kind of the vision and in, in some of the things that have been started to be implemented across the system via our department. And other little tidbits that you may need to know or want to know or might not want to know. So first of all, let me describe what clinical ethics is. Um, <laughs> When someone asks me what I do for a living in a social situation, I often think to myself, oh, great, this question. And then I think to myself, um, how do I explain this? And then I immediately go to the idea that I just, I work in healthcare, and that's what I say. And then they say, oh, are you a nurse or a doctor? And I pause for a moment and think, how far into this do I want to get? And... I quickly realized that that thing that you're supposed to have, that elevator pitch about what your, what, you, what your job is, doesn't work for me. You'd have to be stuck in an elevator for me to explain to you uh, what I do for a living. And then I start off by saying, okay, look, I've never explained this the same way twice, but let me take a stab at it, and then end up sounding like a grim reaper. So I've come up with kind of a new mechanism that I use for teaching to describe what clinical ethics is. And it's a stoplight scenario. Uh, this is going to require a little bit of audience participation, and I'm going to ask very tricky questions. So if you could do your best to answer them correctly, uh, that would be great. So I say clinical ethics is kind of like a stoplight. Um, it's a situation in which in most scenarios you know what to do, but other times you don't. For instance, if you get to a stoplight and it's red, you Oh, that is the best audience participation ever. And if it's green? Okay, what do you do if it's yellow? All right, first of all, this is a lecture on ethics. So let's all be honest. We all speed up and go through the light. Also, I'd like to note coming from Chicago, Indiana has extra long yellow lights. They're wonderful. In Chicago, I think it's the federal minimum of 4.5 seconds, which is not long enough for more than like one and a half cars to get through. So I appreciate that. But back to the point. At a yellow light, what you're meant to do is to look at what's going on around you, weigh out the evidence, and make the best choice. There's not a hard and fast rule. You know, if some dude's barreling up behind you in his Ford F-150, I think that's a truck, um, at 90 miles an hour, you better step on it and get through the light so you don't get rear-ended. But if you see, you know, you're wandering around Fountain Square and you see um, a mother with a baby carriage starting to creep out into the street, it'd be wise of you to potentially slam on your brakes. Just take the evidence given to you, weigh out what the best options are, and make a decision when there is no hard and fast rule. Um, as Robin kind of mentioned, I came from Catholic healthcare, and um, there was a well-known uh, moral theologian and ethicist named Jack Gallagher, and he said something that has stuck with me throughout my career, and that is there are no ethics-free zones, especially within healthcare. Healthcare is a practice that necessarily deals with human lives and with their dignity. Um, we're always making ethical judgments. We don't often identify them as ethical judgments because they don't feel uncomfortable. And when we think of ethics situations, we think of uncomfortable situations, but we're always dealing with ethics in the decisions we make on a daily basis. So what, what then is clinical ethics? 
clinical ethics is a practical discipline within the healthcare arena uh, that provides a structured approach to assist health professionals and families and patients uh, in identifying ethical issues, helping sort through or analyze what ought we do and why, and resolving, helping to resolve or bring resolve to the issues that have arisen. Most of these decisions tend to be around decision-making, often about medical treatment. The patients are an integral player in the decision-making process, most often in uh, an ethics consult. It also can, and, and then also healthcare professionals. It can also include families, other legal decision-makers, potentially um, outside sources like guardians, or maybe another institution in which the patient may be going to in the future. But what happens is it inadvertently pits values against each other, whether those are personal values, religious beliefs, up against potentially professional guidelines or standards of care. Um, ethics is, a, is it necessarily an internal conflict of values. So that seems pretty simple, right? Um, ethics is complex, requires a lot of uh, fact gathering and information. It requires um, a lot of different skill sets. I would say people that do ethics for a living often wear many different hats from being able to um, uh, be uh, the role of a caregiver to a social worker, have legal knowledge, um, and then the framework of ethics from which to work. Let me give an example. Joe comes into his doctor's office with back pain. Doctor says, I think you need surgery. Joe says, hmm, no thanks. I'm just gonna go back to the chiropractor. And the provider thinks to himself, uh, no, that's a really bad idea. I don't think Joe should do that. What should I do now? And then says, Maybe I should get an ethics consult. Maybe not, but starts to think through what could be done. The first thing to notate here is what are the two things that are in conflict? In this scenario, the conflict is really between autonomy or the patient's uh, right to self-govern and beneficence. The physicians want to do the right thing for the patient. Are the patient's values being pitted up against standard of care? Is that an appropriate assessment or is that not what's happening here? Should the physician be looking to continue to give recommendation to the patient? When does that fall over into coercion or strong persuasion? Does the patient have the right information to make an informed decision? Um, what are the values of the patient? Is this about money? I don't wanna be cut on because I don't wanna pay the bill uh, and I don't have insurance. Or is this a scenario in which um, the patient believes more is less and doesn't really tr trust the neurosurgeon um, and has been going to his chiropractor for many years and trusts that his chiropractor will help him make best, the best decisions? And then what about the physician reaching out to the chiropractor and having a conversation about plan of care? Is that a breach of privacy or just an appropriate uh, continuation of practice? We have lots of scenarios like this in medicine that bring up a lot of interesting points, things that come into conflict, information that needs to be sorted through. And that's why a department like ours exists. IU Health has a core set of values, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but I think it is important to note that the work of clinical ethics matches very well with the four values of IU Health. Um, excellence, clinical ethics is a service that helps uh, people do their best at all times and in new ways to think about things in ways they might not have previously through education and other um, resources. It helps bring about purpose to people's work by dealing with things like moral distress um, so that people can go back to their work and think, even though that this is really difficult, 
I can do this. This is, this is the work I do and it is good work, even if things don't go the way I feel that they should go. Uh, team, we, the people aren't going it alone. I think that that's a very important component of the work ethics does is support teams and individual team members in uh, their discomfort, in their moral distress, et cetera. And then compassion, just creating an environment in which ethics provides uh, a framework in which to apply respect, empathy, and kindness, to show compassion to our patients, their families, and the people providing care at IU Health. So I don't know when exactly, but at some point in the last few years, there was demonstrated need for an, a new department to be formed at IU Health, namely the Department of Clinical Ethics. Um, and a lot of work went into forming that department that we now work in. Um, and some people wonder, well, FCME or the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics exists. Why is this new department exist? So uh, this is a pretty good description of why and how we work together. Noting at the bottom that we work together all the time. We're physically housed in the same space um, to really create a vibrant ethics community to support our clinicians, staff, and patients. Uh, it was important to do this in a way that was uh, at a system level instead of primarily at a local level. Um, so part of the charge of our department is to be a system department, not just a local AHC department for which FCME has tried to cover uh, some of the system issues, but realized that the bandwidth just wasn't there to be able to do all of that work. This is a chart of uh, kind of administrative and reporting relationships. Um, I think really by putting this slide on here, what I was trying to demonstrate is there's so much overlap in the work we do. Um, for instance, um, at AHC, most of the Fairbanks Center faculty sit on the ethics subcommittee for, the, um, for AHC. We do a ton of work together and a reporting structure is generally the same up through mission and values, the values committee, and then to the IU uh, Health Board of Directors. So I'd like to introduce the members of my department. Um, first of all, Kelsey Miller who has my Kelsey Miller and her dog, because obviously these are all pictures with our dogs. Um, Kelsey is actually the newest person to our department, although she has been working at the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics um, for over a year now. We have been able to utilize half her bandwidth to support our department. Um, and she is our new project coordinator extraordinaire. That was a mouthful. Um, before coming to IU Health, Kelsey worked in tourism and event management, which is, I think, really, really helped with her organizational skills and our ability to utilize uh, that high level organizational skill set, as well as a real uh, thorough thinking process that she provides to us. Um, a little fun fact about Kelsey is she loves true crime, but She's also kind of a chicken and can't listen to true crime things before bedtime or in the dark or when she's alone. So it has to be a very specific scenario in which Kelsey can listen to her true crime podcasts, mostly on the way to work, I think, is when she listens to them. The second person I'd like to introduce is Jane Hartstock. Um, Jane has been a part of our department as the director of ethics for the Academic Health Center for over a year now, but has been around uh, IU Health for about four years, about four years, I might be making up numbers, um, for about four years and um, has also been teaching in the Medical Humanities Department at IUPUI. Prior to that, she lived her life in Chicago as a med malpractice litigator. Um, and then got suckered into moving back to, back to Indiana from whence she came. Um, Jane and her husband met swimming, which is not surprising. If you know Jane, she's a very avid swimmer. Um, but 
a little fun fact about that is when they got married, they went and took wedding photos in the natatorium and they might be the only people who have ever taken taken wedding photos on the 10 meter platform at the natatorium. Oh, did I say anything about your dog? Miss. So Jane recently just got a dog, Sammy, as you can tell by the puppy licking picture. Um, and she's super cute. She kind of looks like Scooby-Doo if you ask me. Um, and then lastly, me. I, uh, this is a picture with my dog, Bean, who's an old lady, and she's named after my poetry professor in college at DePaul, Barbara Bean. Um, I, oh, where did I come from? So I, prior to coming to IU, I worked at Presence Health, which is a large Catholic system in Chicago for uh, 12 years as the director of ethics there. Um, my Fun fact about myself is I've never lost a sock while doing laundry. I know. How many people can say that? So where are we now? In June of the summer, 2019, uh, Kelsey and I created a needs assessment for hospitals with ethics committees that was sent to the leadership of each ethics committee um, at the following hospitals. IU Health um, at the Academic Center noted it was only Methodist and University. Riley had its own needs assessment. Uh, Arnett, Ball Memorial, Bloomington, North Hospital and West Hospital. The survey looked at the makeup of the committees, the structure, membership, functionality, output, um, whether or not the subcommittees were doing work in consultation, education, policy, and membership. Um, it was about 50 questions long, so I'm sure everybody was really excited to fill out a 50-question survey, but they did, and for that we are grateful. Some points of interest from the survey. Restoring, reporting structures of the ethics committees are varied. Um, I wasn't particularly surprised to find this as in my last system, that was also true. Some report to an administrative uh, person and or structure, so a board. Some report to the medical staff and some are just free flying committees that I think are meeting uh, joint commission requirements without having a reporting structure for function. A lot of the committees that are medical staff committees um, require in their bylaws that there be administrative or board membership, uh, board persons that have membership on the ethics committees. And we did find that that is extraordinarily low and almost non-existent. The, there are very few board or administrative persons on the ethics committees. Uh, there's no formal membership process in most of the committee for most of the committees. Uh, most of the committees don't have a mechanism of collecting and analyzing data about their ethics consultations. There was no for greater, greater engagement, policy development, and local education. I think what I gleaned from some of that information was that people aren't feeling like their ethics committees are particularly productive. Uh, that they may sit around and have discussions, but nothing comes of those discussions in the way of action items. Almost all of the committees have at least one member who has completed the FCME fellowship, so that's wonderful. Um, hopefully getting more soon. Um, all of the hospitals have an ethics consultation service, and all but one of those services are 24-7 services, so that's also very impressive. And that the members of the consultation service uh, have been noted to have training and education in moral reasoning and ethical theory. Um, okay. um, so my colleague, Dr. Brian Leland, has been heading up ethics at Riley and was working on a needs assessment at Riley when I showed up last October. He did quite a thorough needs assessment by interviewing 33 of 
administrative persons, division chiefs and leaders at Riley. Um, one on one interviews, not the kind of survey I did where you sent it out and, and asked for responses. Um, while looking at nine years of PEDS consultations at Riley, from gleaning what he could from that information, he then formed a pediatric ethics senior advisory council, which is comprised of administration, nursing leadership, social work leadership, ethics leadership from the Fairbanks Center, and senior staff physician. Um, and that group is meant to look at what came from the needs um, assessment and how best to move that forward within, within the arena of Riley Hospital. One thing that will occur or is, in, is moving forward is a PEDS ethics subcommittee that will start. So where are we going? Ethics awareness, education, services, and committees across IU Health. It's a big undertaking. Uh, and some of it remains to be seen as to what it'll look like. It's a ongoing process. Um, but one of the first ways to do that is to look at systemness. Systemness is a word I learned when I came here to IU Health, which indicates to me within IU Health, things are a little bit siloed and there needs to be a creation of some level of consistency and uniformity throughout the system. Um, and the way that our department is helping to create more systemness is to, uh, by creating recommended ethics standards, which I'll go over a little bit in a minute, um, to unsilo ethics committees in a way that they uh, can adapt to the needs of each local entity, whether it's a hospital or a clinic or a service line, uh, but while still respecting the culture and needs of that individual uh, entity. And then to lastly create a system ethics committee. The idea there, or council, the idea there is um, in that kind of natural siloed way that we do things that each ethics committee might be doing the same thing that the ethics committee down the street is doing. And um, it would be wise of them to get together and share the information that they uh, come up with things that they learn about, share ideas, create best practices, uh, look at system policies. I think it's important to note that um, even in my short time here in dealing with different hospitals that are having um, concerns about what we would kind of call medical futility or potentially inappropriate treatment, while the academic health center has a great policy to address that, and it, you know, another hospital has something similar to address that they're inconsistent and create problems um, kind of inadvertently. But if we had some continuity and they were able to be applied locally, uh, it would make an enormous difference in the way we write policies and how we educate around policies and protocol. So recommended standards, these are just the topics um, in the set of recommended standards that I've put together. Um, what does an ethics committee look like? What's its structure? Um, what are the expectations around competencies? Uh, what kind of productivity should come out of an ethics committee? How do they evaluate themselves over time? Um, one thing that I think is tricky there and has been noted to me as I travel around the system is keeping people on as members on an ethics committee is very difficult. Turnover is extraordinarily high. Uh, consultation and advisement, I'll go through these in more depth, education, policy review and development and leadership support. So the left side, I have right left confusion, this side, the left side, um, this is what our ethics committees look like right now. We have six regional ethics committees and by regional, the idea is that the bigger hospitals house the ethics committees and the little hospitals participate in the ethics committee and use the bigger ethics committee as a resource. I don't think that that's actually what's occurring at this time, but that seems to be the idea of how it's set up. All of the committees are chaired by physicians. They're interdisciplinary committees. Uh, the size of the committees range from about eight to 30 members. They have some subcommittees 
Um, my feeling is the subcommittees are kind of in name only and aren't producing a lot of functional output at this point other than the consultation committee. The meetings range from monthly to quarterly uh, for an hour to an hour and a half and the agendas are not consistent. Going forward, the recommended standard would be to continue all the regionalized committees uh, to be able to help the smaller hospitals within a region use the resources at the bigger hospital and create an actual uh, and actually more robust ethics committee. And then have those be chaired by physicians or administrators, depending on what their reporting structure is. It would be wiser probably if the reporting structure is up to administration to have administration be the one who chairs the committee. Um, that does not negate the need for a physician on the committee. It just is who is, who is running uh, the show. It would continue to be interdisciplinary, um, eight to 15 members, 30 is kind of a lot. Uh, subcommittees would be functional in nature. There would be a policy education subcommittee and then a consultation subcommittee. Um, meetings would be bi-monthly for an hour with a set agenda. And another thing we're working on is the creation of a committee charter. Um, one thing I noted in some conversations with people throughout the system is you know, they want to have um, kind of a mission vision of what it is that their committee is doing and that seems to lack for them. So helping put together a committee charter uh, might help give some direction to the ethics committees. Consultation and advisement. <clears throat> um, I would argue that consultation and advisement is, is our bread and butter. It's why ethics committees exist um, is to do consultation and advisement. And we've kind of, in our department, broken this down into two um, distinct types of consults that a consultation service should provide. I'll get a little bit more into that as we go along here. Um, some of the things that we've been providing to uh, the hospitals throughout the system is a framework from which an ethics consultation service should work um, to help the ethics committees form working consult teams that consist of more than one person because it's really not a good idea to have one person do all your ethics consultations. Um, I did that for about 10 years. It's a horrible idea. Um, knowing, helping them understand when to elevate the ethics consult. Do they, is it appropriate to say, you know, this is a consult I feel comfortable with dealing, I'm on call, I feel comfortable dealing with it myself, or should I get a small group of the ethics consultation service together and uh, work through this? Or is this something that we need to call the Department of Clinical Ethics at the system level and get some help with. Also, you know, making sure that they're tapping into the resources that are available to them at the local level, you know, risk, legal, chaplaincy, social work, palliative care, you know, the myriad of, of uh, other departments that can be very helpful in these scenarios. Um, I'll talk a little bit about organizational consults in a minute, but first looking at data collection. Um, for a resource we gave to the ethics committees to look at is, here's, here's a suggestion of things that people might want to look at when they're concerned about an ethics issue or have posted in units to think, well, this is might be when I would call for an ethics consult. Um, most common topics, of course, are end of life issues, uh, issues that deal with doctor-patient relationship and a myriad of other things. Uh, I'm going to skip this and come back. So what frequent issues do we see in, in our consultative work here at AHC? Um, the most common ethics issues are withdrawing and hold, withholding and then provider moral distress. I think it's another time to point out that this is very closely linked with IU health's values. Um, when we're dealing with issues of withdrawing and hold, withholding, compassion is, is an, a very important part of how we approach this in terms of how we approach patients and families and, and the caregivers dealing with such a tough scenario. And then excellence. This, if we're gonna deal with a scenario in which withdrawing and withholding is on, on the table, we have to do this well. We can't, we can't make a mess of it and create a good scenario. 46% of 
uh, ethics issues stem from provider moral distress. I think that is a pretty strong indication that team is a uh, value there, that the, te the team needs to be supported, knowing it's not going alone, and then to provide purpose to what it is that they're doing. Uh, I think this is when, when you start having moral distress, as Lucia would probably very readily point out, um, when you start having moral distress, your purpose in the work you do starts to slip away. And hopefully um, our intervention helps to uh, mitigate some of that lack of purpose. Um, when we do ethics consultations, we often do interventions. And we have uh, most of our interventions include, 58% of our interventions include uh, moral support for the team and making recommendations. I think it's also important to note that we do other things, um, and this shows that we're working with many other departments all the time, referring to risk or legal, um, that we spend a lot of time doing our work by being present at a family meeting. If 21% if of consults require presence at a family meeting, this is not going to be a short consult. Um, and I, I note that palli referral to palliative care is a low number, and I felt surprised by that initially, and then kind of thought to myself, we probably didn't have to ask for a referral to palliative care because palliative care was probably already involved. Okay, so I'm going backwards. As part of um, our resources that the department has put out, um, we've done a couple of things in terms of data collection and just getting our services out there. First, to get our service known widely, we created ethics consultation service cards. Um, a little different than a normal business card. It has all six people at uh, the center who do ethics consultations listed there, um, and then the number to request an ethics consult. So that if you know someone knows that Robin does ethics consults, and Robin just gives that person her card, that they don't just start calling Robin every time they have an issue. But here's here's the card that has the information that will be most helpful to you and your team when you have an ethics issue come up. We are doing a post-consult survey. Um, and our post-consult survey is a questionnaire about how did we do? Um, I think it's important to note that this could be very loaded, uh, that that people have an expectation that the ethics service is gonna ride in on their unicorn and they're going to wave a magic wand and fix some things. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a magic wand or a unicorn, but if anybody here does, please see me afterwards. Um, what we do ask about in this, in this uh, post-consult survey is, do we respond to you in a timely fashion? Was our communication effective? Did we document in the chart appropriately and in a way that you could understand if that was an intervention that we provided? Are we approachable? What we don't ask is, did you like the outcome? Um, this started in July. Um, we get about four post-consult surveys back a month, so we don't have a lot of great numbers yet. Um, but they seem to be positive thus far. So organizational consultation or something we kind of colloquially have been calling issue consults. Um, we have done, I think in the time that Jane has been here, 15 to 20 of them, um, 17, I, my range was good. Um, they are consultations that come from a myriad of places, whether it be a requester, such as uh, government affairs or the palliative care department, about issues that we know will come up time and time and time again. Um, a few examples here. Uh, for general consent, Dr. Jonathan Gottlieb, who is the CMO for the system, asked us to provide uh, an ethical analysis and regulatory analysis on the general consent form for care at IU Health, uh, noting that his concern was if anybody crosses anything out on the general consent form, 
it's kind of null and void. We won't allow that to happen. And is that appropriate? So along with quality, legal, Dr. Gottlieb and an administrative fellow, um, we started to look at that and are continuing to look at it. Um, Jane has very wisely asked for the input of the IU Center for Bioethics in terms of the research component language on the form. Um, and this is an ongoing, all of these are actually ongoing um, organizational consult. Another one uh, we've been dealing with, I think for quite a long time, is an extended plan of care for patients. This is a scenario in which we've been working with social work and case management teams to provide an ethical framework slash plan uh, for dealing with patients who have kind of become stuck. You know, the kind of, you don't, you can't go home, but you can't stay here situation, um, which really and then ends up being, well, I guess you're gonna stay here. Um, how do we deal with that? How can we further the right level of care for the right people at the right time? Um, and the answer to that is, it's always messy, but we should have a procedure and protocol in place to deal with that um, and make sure that people who have these things, that their care plans are readily available to, um, to all people that care for them, that they don't just get buried in the chart somewhere. Um, the next one on here is consent issues with incarcerated patients. We got a request uh, from palliative care to look at this because they were seeing a lot of patients who were incarcerated patients who were requiring palliative care intervention, whether it be hospice or, or the um, general needs of palliative care. And uh, there was kind of a myriad of issues in terms of how consent was given uh, for patients, incarcerated patients who were uh, able to make their own decisions versus those who were not and those who didn't have decision makers. And um, our legal extern last year, Allie Card, I see you back there, um, who is now an ethics fellow at, at FCME, uh, worked tirelessly on doing legal research um, to help us understand how we should move forward with this. We started to look at policies and protocols, and I think for Allie's fellowship, she'll probably continue to look at this topic and maybe write a white paper um, on, on the topic. We worked. Uh, we we're working at this point with legal and risk on um, moving the policy forward. System issues with advanced care planning documentation. Um, I don't think that this is a new issue. I think this is an issue that I've seen in every place that I've ever worked. And um, it's kind of the, the thing of how do we do this well throughout the system? Who owns the paperwork? When does the paperwork get updated? How do we scan it into the chart? What if they fill it out? How do we uh, remove it if the patient decides they wanna change it? There's just so much to this in a system, um, in a process way, in a paper trail type way um, that we know is being taken care of well at individual locations and by individual service lines, but how do we do this well throughout the system? Um, so spiritual services, social work quality, um, and we've been uh, granted some bandwidth of uh, Hannah, who's an administrative fellow, to help us look at this issue as a system issue instead of as a local issue um, for IU Health. Um, policy review and development. Mint is a very proactive model of ethics. Uh, it's important that ethics committees are at the table in one way or another for a, a multitude of policies when they're being developed or reviewed, or sometimes are integral in saying, hey, hospital, we really need a policy on this. Um, so keeping a kind of checklist, which the recommendations have of the types of policies that should be um, in the purview, not owned by, but in the purview of ethics uh, is part of the documents, the standard document. Education is also a pretty important component of what an ethics committee or an ethics service does. Um, uh, just by the formation of our department, 
the amount of ability to provide education for the system has grown by two, two people, myself and Jane. Um, not to mention all the great things that FCME does, but now we have that ability and I travel throughout the system to help um, further ethics education. Kelsey and I have put together a pretty good resource binder uh, as an educative mechanism for the uh, ethics committees to help them start to grow uh, as we move forward. And in some month next summer, we will be providing an ethics intensive to, tr to create more training opportunities for ethics committee members. Um, FCME has some well-established uh, educational opportunities. The fellowship, uh, which is a 10 month long, one day a week during those 10 months, uh, education and training and practical skills of clinical ethics, uh, UBEC training, or just UBEC services, um, UBEC being unit-based ethics conversations um, where people are either taught or led in conversations about ethically challenging experiences, navigating moral distress mainly. I recently did the training, it was excellent. I would highly recommend it. Um, Impact, which is um, a workshop for care providers, mainly nurses, I think but others are invited uh, to help learn how to facilitate communication around goals of care, prognosis, other end-of-life issues, and palliative care. The lecture series, which this is, um, happens monthly and a wide variety of ethics topics this year. The ethics conference that Robin was mentioning at the beginning, um, which is September 27th, and I think will provide some excellent workshops and uh, keynotes on ethics topics the day long for a nominal fee. Uh, I would highly recommend everybody come. Leadership support. In my career, uh, I've supported and helped create many ethics committees, not with, within systems and within local standalone hospitals. And one thing that I can tell you that will make or break the ability um, for an the effectiveness of an ethics committee to grow and become effective um, is leadership. If there's no leadership support, the whole thing falls apart. But in our case, we're very lucky to know that we have very high level leadership support from Kevin Armstrong, who's the chief of staff and executive vice president for mission and values, who gave the go ahead um, and probably the funding to create our department. Um, Dr. Paul Helft, who I think has left the building, um, who is the Vice President of Clinical Ethics, to whom I report, and the Director of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics, also just indicating some more partnership between the two service lines, um, in asking for this department to be created. As part of next steps, um, I'll be scheduling times to meet with CMOs, CNOs, and CEOs at each of the local hospitals to garner um, support in having some uh, leadership champions from some of them, from having them demonstrate, help, helping them to demonstrate how ethics is a priority in their, in their hospitals, and then mostly to be able to foster an environment in which <laughs> Um, the work of ethics is, is truly supported. So an important thank you. I am very grateful to the leadership at FCME for recognizing the need uh, for this new department and making it happen. Oh, you came back in and I'm thanking you right now. Um, but it, FCME did um, was integral in making our department happen. So. Thank you guys for helping create our department. All right, so now I have oh, 10 minutes for questions. Am I supposed to say something about calling in or texting? I didn't do that. Comments, questions, concerns, ideas? 
in a previous slide you had um, a list of topics and there was one that it was the only one that I didn't really understand what it covered. Um, I think it was failure to warn. Was that the terminology? Duty to warn, yes. Can you explain that please? Um, yeah, so there is a concept that sometimes uh, providers have a duty to warn. I need to go back to that slide, don't I? Um, a duty to warn patients about things. And um, the classic case of that is a Tarasoff case, which was a case in which a patient with mental illness came to um, his provider and said he was going to kill his girlfriend. And he did kill his girlfriend. And then they went back and say, why didn't you tell the girlfriend she was going to get killed? And so there became a duty to warn. Um, that has kind of spread its wings a little bit. I didn't do that. Um, it spread its wings a little bit in the way that what does that expand to? Are we obligated to tell, um, you know, a patient whose uh, husband has HIV that they are in, you know, danger of contracting HIV because the husband will not disclose that information? That would be a duty to warn scenario. Does that answer your question? In the survey that was completed that had, you listed out the um, frequent ethics issues that mm -hmm. the consults had seen, what time frame was that survey completed over? I'm sorry if I missed that. So that frequent ethics issues was, I think, an entire retrospective of the consults that have been done here at AHC and what um, data we've collected from those consults. So that's very specific to AHC, but just notating um, this is what it looks like when we start to do that. And we will begin to compile all of the data into one um, location in REDCap, and it can be sorted out by location as well. No, you get whoever is on call, which is usually Jane. <laughs> oh, how do you request a consult? What signals? No, just kidding. Um, you request a consult, our number was on that card, or you call the operator and the operator will page us. And that's in any of the hospitals mostly. All right, I have a call from, or a text from outside. Uh, what is the first step in beginning a consultation service? I feel like this is a trick question. Um, I think the first is to figure out who has the abilities, number one, understanding of, of ethics, what an ethics consultation is comprised of, do they have the education in that? Um, and then secondarily, um, making sure that people have the bandwidth to participate in the ethics consultations because you can't have someone who cannot feasibly do an ethics consult because they don't have the time um, be part of your ethics consultation service. And then also to make sure that there is more than one person doing ethics consultations. Um, in the resource books that we put together, um, there is a outline of how an ethics consultation service should be built um, and kind of the mechanisms of moving things forward. Hopefully that answers that person's question. All right, if there's no more questions, Amy, thank you. And we will see you guys next month. Thank you. Did you want to take a nap?